Give me the cue there. Uh. So, good evening and welcome to the MTU Cork Campus Open November event. Uh, my name is Brendan O'Connell and I am the Head of School of Science and Informatics here in MTU Cork Campus. Uh, before we begin the session, um, I have some housekeeping requirements that I need to remind you of. And the first is to highlight the exit routes uh, from the centre. So we have two in the front and one on the left back corner. And in the unlikely event that you hear a continuous alarm, I would ask you to make your way to the nearest uh, exit point. In terms of the COVID-19 requirements, uh, can I ask you where possible that you continue to wear uh, the face covering, use the sanitizers as appropriate, and I've also been asked uh, for you to complete the attendance sheets uh, on each of uh, the tables. Finally, can you please turn your, your mobile devices uh, off, that they'll always be one, uh, so that we don't have uh, a disruption uh, during the, the session. In terms of introducing the school, the School of Science and Informatics is comprised of the Department of Biological Sciences, the Department of Computer Science, the Department of Physical Sciences, and the Department of Mathematics. We have over 2,500 students registered in the school over 32 uh, full-time undergraduate and postgraduate programs. And we have a re very dynamic research community of over 120 PhD students registered in our research groups and centers. In this session, we will be providing information and chatting to you on the programs delivered by the Department of Physical Sciences and the Department of Biological Sciences. And in terms of the running order uh, for this after, sorry, this evening, we will commence with the programs that are offered by the Department of Physical Sciences, and we will run the information session from 8 until 8.45. And then at 8.45, we will commence the information sessions for programs offered uh, by the Department of Biological Sciences. So at this point, I'd like to call on my colleague, uh, Dr. Donna Omani, uh, to provide information on programs offered in the Department of Physical Sciences. Thanks, Brendan. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, great to see a, a crowd of some sorts here. Uh, it's great to see all, all the tables full, as full as they can be. Um, it's been a long time coming, I guess. So my name is Don O'Mahony. I'm uh, the head of department at Physical Sciences here in MTU Cork Campus. Um, delighted to be here tonight to tell you about our programs. And I'm lucky to be joined as well by some of our staff and students. We have Dr. Uh, Elaine O'Keefe, who is the year one chemistry coordinator. Mr. Martin Hill, who is a graduate of our instrumentation programs last year. We have Ellen Fitzgerald, who is a graduate of our environmental science program, and we have Daniela Lopez, who is a postgraduate student in our, uh, one of our analytical chemistry research groups. So, um, what I want to do tonight is to give you an overview of our programs primarily, but also to give you an introduction to the department. So if you do decide to join us, hopefully you get a feel for what it's like to, to join the Department of Physical Sciences and what the experience will be like. So I, I'm broadly categorizing in three core areas. Uh, in total, we have, I think it's six, possibly seven offerings in terms of CEO entry routes, but they broadly categorize around three areas. The first one is analytical chemistry. Next is instrumentation and industrial physics. And finally, we have environmental science. So I'll try to talk about those three core areas and then there's a few subtleties around level seven and level eight that we can go into detail afterwards. So I'm gonna preempt the first question that I often get when we introduce the department. Uh, what is physical science? Well, physical science is to do with measuring the physical world around us. So 
things like Lent, mass, temperature, the concentration of things in food products, um, pH, if anybody's doing chemistry. Um, they're the kind of things that, that we, we do and we measure and, and we love to measure. So that, that's what physical sciences is all about. Um, our department, uh, we, we, we are physical sciences now. In the past, we were actually two different departments of chemistry and physics that came together. Um, we have a core of about 30 staff in total between uh, lecturing staff, administrative staff, and uh, technical staff. And I, I often say at these kind of events, if you come to MTU, the chances are we'll meet you if you're doing any kind of a STEM program because not only do we teach the students in our own department, we teach all of the students taking either a science or an engineering program uh, in their first year here. And we're, we're, we're delighted and proud to be able to do that. So even if you don't join us directly, we'll, we'll probably see you at some stage. Um, the three core areas that I talked about, analytical chemistry, instrumentation and industrial physics and environmental science. Um, from the outset, they might seem a little bit different in terms of disciplines, but actually it turns out that they're quite interrelated and they're interrelated because of where the graduates go. The majority of our graduates, about 70%, go to the regional biopharma chemical sector and um, they often end up working in the same companies but in different roles. So um, I, I try to broadly or generally categorize it as being the instrumentation people work at the start of a process if you're making a food product or a pharmaceutical drug. Um, the analytical chemists check that product at the end of the, the process, the production process. And then the environmental scientists make sure that it's all done with minimal environmental impact. So um, as I say, they often end up working together. So I, I'm going to jump through each of the three disciplines because, again, we often get questions, you know, what's analytical chemistry, what's instrumentation, and what's industrial physics and environmental science and monitoring. So I'll very quickly run through those, and hopefully this will uh, give you a better picture of what it's all about. So the first one, what's analytical chemistry? Well, analytical chemistry is a specific type of, or a branch of chemistry where, as, as the name suggests, we analyze things. And that could be a food product or a, a pharmaceutical drug. It could even be water. And I, I'm going to talk to Elaine a little bit later about that. But I, I often, when I'm trying to explain this, I say analytical chemists are a little bit like what you might see in CSI Miami. So I see all the, the moms and dads nodding, the young ones don't. CSI Miami is, so, is uh, 10 years gone. But essentially, we're, we're a bit like forensic scientists. So we analyze food products, pharmaceuticals, water, etc. So the kind of things, for example, when you look at your cornflakes box in the morning and you see there's so many grams of iron or some uh, vitamin in there, it's more than likely that an analytical chemist actually analyzed that and did that measurement to ensure that that's, that's what was in, in the product. Similarly, if you look at pharmaceutical drugs, if you look at anything even like Panadol, hopefully you all know a typical Panadol drug has 500 milligrams of a, an, an active pharmaceutical ingredient in there, par, uh, paracetamol. It's usually an analytical chemist who did that measurement and ensured that there was 500 milligrams in there. If we move on to in instrumentation and industrial physics, so instrumentation is a, a specific branch of, of um, the physical sciences where you're dealing with what we call scientific instrumentation. So they're the, the, what we call the instruments or the tools, the gadgets that you go, that you use to measure. It could be flow, temperature, uh, pressure, humidity, you name it. This room is probably full of instruments at the moment monitoring the humidity levels. Maybe even now it's monitoring the CO2 levels because that's become so important. So instrumentation graduates are experts in that. So if you're somebody who loves gadgets and you love measuring things and you love collecting data, instrumentation is probably something you should consider. And there's a huge demand for these graduates because if you're making any kind of a regulated product, whether that's food or pharmaceutical, um, or even ensuring that water is clean and safe to drink, uh, you need to have all these gadgets and instruments to make sure that it is safe to, to consume. And that's what the instrumentation people do. They're, they're a critical part of any kind of regulated industry. And being where we are in the Cork region, you can imagine that that is extremely important for especially the pharmaceutical sector. Um, the third area that I talked about, environmental science, we, we, we focus on one particular area, that's environmental monitoring. Um, so measuring, 
Again, things like water quality and air quality in particular. And you, you've probably all heard the news recently about air quality and particularly the, the particulates that are in the air. That's a particular speciality that we have here in our own department in terms of measuring those. So it's, it's a specific flavor of environmental science that we do here in CIT. And it aligns up, I guess, with the analytical chemistry and the instrumentation work that's done here as well in that we're, we're specialists at taking measurements. So, if you are considering one of our programs, these are your options. Um, I had to take a second look at these because our codes changed this year. So broadly speaking, we have the Analytical Pharmaceutical Chemistry Program, which that should say level seven. We have the Analytical Chemistry with Quality Assurance Program, which is a level eight program. Environmental Science and Sustainable Technology, Applied Physics and Instrumentation, and we've, uh, in Instrument Engineering is the final level eight program. So broadly speaking, there's three level eight programs and two level seven programs. There's also a common entry route which gives you a bit of flexibility in your first semester if you're not sure, you know, will I go down the chemistry route or will I go down the instrumentation or the environmental route? That gives you an option in your first, your first semester as well. And finally, we have uh, a joint program which UCC. It's called Industrial Physics. It's, it's the first program of its kind in, in Ireland in terms of having a joint program between two um, institutes or universities now. Um, that started approximately five years ago. We have had our first cohort of graduates last year. That, that's a really attractive degree for somebody who likes their physics but maybe doesn't want to go down the route of, of you know, real theoretical type physics, likes to do things a bit more hands-on but is still you know, um, likes their gadgets and things. So uh, in, industrial physics is a good option there for somebody who's strong in physics, strong in maths, but likes the, the practical side of things. Okay, so before we go to the panel, um, I'm gonna pop up a few what I often get as, as the frequently asked questions when we're at an event like this. Um, the first two, I'm gonna try and answer straight off. Should I choose level seven versus level eight? What's, what's, what's the advantage of choosing one over the other? Um, in terms of the core programs, level sevens usually sit within level eight programs. And what I mean by that is, for the first three years, they're actually very closely aligned. Um, I suppose the advantage of level seven is twofold. One, um, there isn't the same entry requirement in particular around the number of honor subjects that you have. But secondly, it gives you that leeway that after three years you can decide, you know, maybe I'll step out with an ordinary degree. And in a lot of cases that you, you still have a good chance of employment and it gives you just that break of not having to do the four years. The level eight, of course, is, is by far the most popular option. You know, people want to get the honors degree um, and maybe if you want to go on and do research as well, certainly you'd be advising to, to go down the level eight route. But um, th there's benefits of both, I suppose. What I would say is the level seven maybe gives you a little bit more flexibility, but maybe from an employment perspective, long term, your level eight is, is the option to go with. Um, can I switch between courses? Generally speaking, within the first semester, there's, there's a bit of flexibility there. So if you come in and you start, let's say, doing environmental science and you decide, actually, I might switch over to the chemistry side, that's usually possible, especially within the first semester. And generally across the, the school and the faculty, the, there's a bit of flexibility there because a lot of the core subjects are, are the same. But what I generally advise is if you are going to switch, make your decision as soon as possible. Um, next question, is there work placement? Yes, all of our programs have work placement. And um, you'll be glad to hear that. In most cases, the work placement is actually paid. Um, because again, where the students tend to go is, you know, your pharmaceutical, your food and beverage, um, your environmental testing labs, and in general, the placements are played. Not always, but, but you have a good chance there. So that is one attractive thing, I think, uh, about our programs. And what I generally say about work placement is, if you behave yourself on work placement, you have a very good chance of, of, of being in the door with the company longer term. Um, next question, can I join a research lab from a final year project? So some of you might have a real keen interest in, in doing some exciting research. And I, I would say certainly yes, as a department, we're in a great position there to do research in either environmental, um, physics, chemistry, even some things a, a little bit different around down the route of astronomy. We have links with a number of research groups and centers around the Cork area, where, uh, or, or even abroad or, or nationally, that you can do your research project. And finally, what are the career prospects for graduates? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit further on that, and I'm just keeping a, an eye on my time. Hopefully, we're, we're sticking to, to, to the track. Okay, so in terms of what, what, are, what do industry generally say about our programs? And the reason I'm, I'm popping industry up here, because 
I'm going to show you a stat later, most of our, our, our graduates do go directly to industry after they graduate after their three or four years. Um, the programs are generally very highly regarded and I would hope maybe some of the, the moms and dads in here at the moment would be familiar with graduates of our own department who are working in the advanced manufacturing sector, in particular in the Cork area, whether that's pharma, as I say, food and beverage, oil and gas, etc. Um, there is quite a range of employment opportunities and again I hope maybe our graduates will give you a flavour of that as well. While maybe 70% of the graduates do work in the biopharma sector, um, we have graduates working in anywhere from banking, IT, networking, um, testing of very specialised products. We have graduates over working with the European Space Agency. It's a real broad remit. Um, the question on work placement, as I say, we're lucky as a department in that generally every year we're able to place all our students, and I guess the environment is, is good for that at the moment because of the, the thriving uh, biopharma sector in particular, um, but there tends to be a broad range of options for the students because, for example, if you have an analytical chemistry uh, qualification or you're in your third year, you have options to go into food analysis, water analysis, petrochemical analysis, um, medicinal analysis, so pharmaceutical product analysis, analysis, you really have a broad range of options there. And uh, as I say, most of the graduates or the, the placement students are paid, which, which makes it uh, very attractive indeed. Um, I, I mentioned earlier uh, about our students, we, we did a survey um, which was, which was uh, funded by, by the National Forum for Teaching and Learning last year. Uh, we surveyed our graduates and um, I thought one of the most striking uh, results from that or the most striking piece of feedback was when we asked them, you know, how long did it take you to, to get your job? And what we found that two thirds of them already had a job lined up before they even graduated. And that's usually a follow on from, from work placement. So what I generally say is, and you're probably sick of hearing this folks, behave yourself in work placement and you're in a very good position with, with a job after. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's a great stat to be able to say of, of our graduates that two thirds of them already had a job lined up um, before they even graduated. Um, where did the graduates go? I have a selection of them here. Hopefully you'll, this is not a branding exercise, but hopefully you'll, you'll recognize a little bit more easily um, these big brands, you know, the big pharmaceuticals, the environmental tests, the food companies, um, we have companies like Gas Networks Ireland, Andrew is, is, is working in Gas Networks Ireland at the moment so he'll talk a little bit about that. So any of the big, there's a lot of service companies as well that, that support these, these large multinationals, so companies like Zenit or Rising Controls, um, Jones Engineering etc, PM, um, the who's who pretty much of, of the advanced manufacturing in the professional sectors. Um, I mentioned on research opportunities, there are a number of really excellent research opportunities if you want to go down that route or even if you want to do your final year project or even your placement with a research group if you if you'd prefer that to industry. We, we work with Blackrock Castle, the Tyndall Institute, um, we have our own research labs here on site. Uh, we, we would have a, a really um, highly regarded analytical chemistry research activity who Danielle is uh, one of the postgraduate students, all based here on Tyndall. We also have the, the Kappa Center as well based here on Tyndall who deal with photonics. So coming up with all the late, latest tricks uh, regarding around photonics and light. Okay, so that's, that's enough of me talking. I'm, I'm going to bring on board a few of our, um, our staff and our students with a few questions. So this is all very staged. I've, I've given them the questions already, so uh, you'll have to excuse them. Hopefully, they, 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 I know they'll do great. But afterwards, if you want to have you know, a more one-to-one -one chat, we'll be down here in, on the right-hand side. Um, feel free to come up to us and ask us any questions. So I, I, I'm going to put a few questions firstly to uh, Dr. Elena O'Keefe, who's, who's our year one chemistry coordinator, and Ms. Daniela Lopez, who is a postgraduate student with the department um, work researching analytical chemistry. So Elaine, uh, I'm popping this question again. I tried to explain what analytical chemistry is, but I'm, I'm going to leave it to the experts. So maybe could you, could you help out on that front? Yep. Oh, it does work. Um, yeah, so analytical chemistry, really, it involves detecting, identifying, and quantifying different kinds of substances. Um, we can analyze anything from um, pharmaceutical products, biopharmaceutical products, uh, 
food, drink, water, environmental waste, um, all of these substances get analysed by analytical chemists using a wide variety of analytical techniques and instrumentation. So I suppose uh, at the end, kind of at the crux of analytical chemistry is about checking and testing to see that what we consume, what we put into our bodies in particular, um, to do with foodstuffs, to do with particularly medicines, that they are safe, that they contain what we, we expect them to contain, and that they do the job that we think they do. Okay. Perfect. So. That was definitely better than my explanation. Um, next question, and I, I get this quite a lot. How does analytical chemistry at MTU differ to other chemistry programs? Because there's, there's quite a number of chemistry courses out there. Well, I suppose that there, there are similarities among chemistry courses. It is, um, you know, it, it is at a, it's, in essence, a chemistry course. We do, we cover all branches, but I think where we're unique um, an MTU and with the, these two courses is the, the emphasis on the practical skills. Okay, there's a really strong emphasis within the department about uh, teaching the key lab skills that you need in research or in industry. And I think that that's something that's highly valued by our students. Um, if you ask them, I think many of them come back and they, they talk about the amount of time they spent in the lab and they talk particularly about their placement and the fact that they do that um, placement in third year in industry that they find invaluable. Yeah, and I've heard this from employers as well. They often say our students hit the ground running when they get into yeah. the lab. So very well regarded as a course in terms of um, the, the lab skills that the students um, come out with. Perfect, Elaine. So next one up, uh, and again, especially since you're the year one coordinator, what, what does first year look like for a, a chemistry student in MTU? Um, busy, okay. And, um, but in, in your first year, you would do the uh, core science subjects you do chemistry, obviously, but you also do physics, you do um, biology, and you do maths. And you do a, a module, a, a teamwork module as well. So there's a, a, a big emphasis on the chemistry skills. You do two chemistry modules in semester one and two, two chemistry modules in semester two, but also covering the other core science subjects in first year. Yeah, and I think the question I often get asked is, do you have to have chemistry coming into the program? No, no. Um, uh, you know, obviously it, it is a good thing if you have chemistry, but we make no assumptions and we, we cover the fundamentals of chemistry in first year. So even if you haven't studied chemistry before, you can still um, come in and do the course and be very, very successful at the course. That's, that's great, Elaine. So, Daniela, I'm going to jump on to you this time because we're going to kind of the other end of the, the, the graduation pipeline. So, um, Daniela is actually an engineer. We'll, we'll forgive that. Um, she's a chemical engineer and she has a huge range of experience in terms of how, how she's used her degree, but now she's in a role where she's doing research in, in analytical chemistry. So, Daniela, would you like to briefly tell us about your, your research activities? Okay, um, talking about my research here in the MTU, uh, that's an analysis of different uh, type of uh, chlorine-free uh, detergents that are um, becoming an, the new substitute of the chlorine detergents in milk. Uh, all the dairy production, uh, all the, the disinfection of the the plants uh, or the factories in itself uh, are using uh, chlorine. And the chlorine had uh, different uh, reactions with the um, uh, organic material inside the, the milk. And that, that products are becoming a, a problem in the long-term consumption. So uh, the European Union is trying to avoid uh, the presence of those uh, dangerous substances. Um, and that's the project that we are working right now here in the, the MTU, uh, trying to prevent 
uh, people getting ill or having diseases like cancer or other type of, of things uh, changing do those uh, detergents. Um, and also, that's something that's really important. Uh, that's something that we use uh, actually in the, not only for the dyer production, that's something that we use a lot in different kind of uh, food production. So uh, this change is really important for uh, not only the Irish uh, security, um, the health security, it's uh, something that is really important for the, the global um, problem that we have. Um, that's it. It's, um, uh, I'm really happy with uh, having the having the, the possibility to be a part of, of this project because uh, the impact of the of the the research that they're making here is really big. So um, I'm glad to, to be a part of this project. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. And I see a few of the, the farmers in the house nodding about the chlorine directive. You probably all know that. Um, Chlorine-free cleaning products will be the norm soon, if, if not al technically already, they're supposed to be out there. So Daniela's work is in conjunction with, with Chagask, where they're looking at, at chlorine-free cleaning products. And I think we talked earlier as well that how an analytical chemistry qualification gives you so many options. I mean, it could be into food, it could be into pharmaceuticals, so. Yeah, but, and not only because of that, because the, the good point about the, this part of chemistry, the chemistry is, in my opinion, the, 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 the three of the, the main science, the natural science, is the most open one, uh, because you could learn about uh, physics, and understand what is the, the, the function of the, physic, uh, the physical part of the, of the things that they're looking for. For example, uh, my work uh, is using uh, spectroscopy techniques uh, for the detection of those uh, products or the byproducts that we are uh, having in, the, in this change. Uh, so that's something that is really useful because you could use uh, physical techniques and also the, the biological uh, part of the reaction between uh, the, the chlorine with the organic material. That's something that's uh, really useful to see the, the side effects of that. Uh, you see, we have the chemistry, the physics, and the, the biology working as, as only one uh, in that part, and it's uh, really useful. It's the, the, the beautiful part of all chemistry. That's great. Thanks very much, Daniela. So now we are going to move on to um, one of our instrumentation graduates, Mr. Martin, Mr. Uh, Andrew Hill. Um, so Andrew has, has very kindly come on board here uh, today. Andrew graduated last year in 2020, in 2021, I guess, in the summer of 2021. Uh, he's working with a company called uh, Neodyne, an international company, uh, but he's based primarily uh, in a number of different sites associated with Gas Networks Ireland. So I'm going to ask kind of the same question again, uh, uh, Andrew, because it's often asked to me. Can I ask you me. one first? What's that? Can I ask you one first? Okay. Where'd you pull that picture out of? <laughs> <laughs> That's your student record, it's there oh, forever. <laughs> so, uh, do you want to tell us, Mar or Andrew, what is instrumentation? What, again, why is it so important to all these big industries? So, with, um, with in in instrumentation, you can use it no matter what industry you're in. So, basically, if there's any sort of manufacturing going on, if there's a process, if there's anything with a machine, you can use in instrumentation in that or apply it to some way in the company. So with the company that I'm with in Neodyne, a lot of what I did in, let's say, the tail end of the course in third and fourth year was kind of automation based. So there's quite a lot of automation program or uh, automation projects going on in the likes of Pepsi and Pfizer's and all over Cork. And what, what you learn in the course is kind of the foundations for, for what they properly use out in, in industry. So, what, like while we in the course might be using, I don't know, Siemens S7 300s, is that what we were using as PLCs? I'll take the course. Order. Inside in, um, in, in the office, let's say, they have them specially ordered from Siemens directly and these things could be four or five grand like a piece and then they, they buy them like so you're buying you're, sweets. You're familiar with the instrumentation. You've seen it in the lab. I've seen it in the you're lab. You're maybe seeing I've a more expensive site. version. Yeah, but there. it's 
like, I, I kind of can't get it across as importantly enough that seeing it inside in the classroom and then seeing it out on site in industry where it's properly used is so, so important. Because with, with this degree, it isn't so much all about learning through the books, it is practical hands-on from the day you start to the day you finish. Throughout the entire four years, I had two or three modules that always had a lab every week. Near enough, there was always practical elements ongoing. So it's, it's so important to get used to it, get comfortable with it, and just understand that what you're doing in a classroom might affect a company that when you go out to work with it could cost them hundreds of thousands of euro if you mess up something or if, if something goes wrong, but you have to know how to fix it. And that's the good thing about the course, is it kind of trains you from the get-go that you have to look at everything kind of abstractly. So you have to, um, if there's a problem with the process, if a flow meter isn't calibrated or whatever, you have to be able to kind of have the knowledge and have the confidence to go ahead and, and do some tests, do some calibrations that aren't connected onto the site or aren't connected onto the process. Because when you do that then, you can come back and say, right, it's fixed, it's working, we can put it back into the process. Because not only then have you saved the company a lot of money, but you also save them getting a technician in, it reduces downtime, all that type of thing. So I think, and, and we've, we've talked about that in the past, that the roles that the graduates take up are often very responsible roles, and that's why they're, they're well paid as well, uh, because you're, you're responsible for producing a regulated product. Um, maybe I have two questions here uh, in addition, Andrew, and two of them, I guess they're kind of linked. Um, can you tell us about your placement and then subsequently your, your current role following graduation? Well, I'm afraid but the talk about placements can be very short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> COVID cancelled um, cancelled my placement. I was weeks away from getting the contract signed and it was cancelled. But in a way, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because a lot of the work that we did in the work placement alternative module that was given to us then, we got kind of a bonus qualification out of it and we got a little bit ahead on our final year projects in the second semester. And through that, that is kind of how I ended up where I'm working now. So I was working with Gas Networks Ireland for my final year project. And the fellow I was with in there is very friendly with one of the fellows who interviewed me for Neodyne when I was doing the interview there. And I just finished the interview with Neodyne. And apparently, five minutes after I left, your man had rung my accord, or not the coordinator, the engineer from Gas Networks. And, oh, and, there was, and he was saying, you know, he's, he's good at working. He's, he's OK when it comes to um, keep you up with projects and whatever. And through that, that's how I managed to kind of land my role in Neodyne. So I was very fortunate then, but if it wasn't for doing the work placement alternative module, I wouldn't have had like the basis or like the foundation to have the work ethic for the final year project. Yeah, so that's so vital. Just for, for those of you, you know, placement was affected by COVID last year, um, but we were lucky within the school um, that we were able to come up with an arrangement, an alternative arrangement where we actually trained our, our graduates in a, in a qualification in something called Lean Sigma, so anybody who works in the manufacturing sector would know what that's all about. It's about optimizing and making your process really efficient. Um, so I suppose it's just testament to, as it was back then, um, the, the, the alternatives that would be put in place to ensure that placement took place because placement is really key for us. Um, and maybe just to wrap it up, I, just to give people an idea of yeah. what you do, Easy. and Andrew, um, you've sent on a few photos, mm. all approved by your manager uh, yep. here, about the, the, the work you do uh, out on site. So maybe if you want to maybe just briefly go through the kind right. of things so, that you do. The, so these pictures are all kind of, they're there are different bits of gear, different bits of kit that's used by Gas Networks Ireland. So a lot of the, the project work that I do, I work more or less directly with like, a G&I going to all of their different sites to kind of um, update their database as such. So they have records dating back 10, 15 years, if not more, of various different instruments and whatever else that they have on site. There's a few of these here that um, that you might not know if, if you did the course, but there's definitely a few that you should recognize. 
So the, the top left one, or top leftmost picture there, is a temperature indicator transmitter. And we have one more or less identical to the one in, is it C228? In one something? of our instrumentation in, in labs. labs, yeah. No, it's a different brand, whatever, but it's, it, it's still the same thing. And if it wasn't for doing the course, I wouldn't have had a clue how to service that, how to calibrate it, how to use it, how it affects the process, etc. Um, the top most or top rightmost image there shows a very long pipe. That's the pipeline towards, or that site itself is in Mitchellstown. And as you can see in the far right hand side, there's a whole lot of instrumentation in one section. Then there's another instrument, another section of instrumentation to the left. But I've got an image later on, which kind of shows the above and below ground part of it. Because what you see on site is very minuscule, but what you see on the drawings below ground, it's a lot more in depth. Um, bottom left most there is a flow computer. So that measures the flow of the gas and pipes, various different points on the pipeline itself, whether it be the inlet, whether it be um, through the boiler system, etc. That the next image or the next two images there are the one piece of gear. That's a gas chromat. That thing costs hundred thousand, I think, maybe a little bit more. So it's very, very expensive. And so I check do the not go near that. Gases. I don't go near that at all. <laughs> very afraid. Um, yeah. The next one then is just a bog standard pump. We've we, we use them inside in in the lab or in the office inside just to test the flow of gas on different systems and modeling. And the last one there is a gas detector and that measures the transmiss or the, what's it called? The emissions of gas that escape from various different pipes and orifices and whatnot. Um, okay. So if anybody wants to really get into the detail later on, Andrew yep. is, is going to be down at the, the, uh, the pull-up stands with us, um, so you, you can really grill them at that stage. So finally, I'd, I'd like to speak um, with Ellen uh, Fitzgerald, who's a graduate of our environmental science programme. So again, thank you, Ellen, for, for coming along here tonight. And I've, I have three questions, which um, I, I'm hoping you'll be able to answer for us. The first one is, why did you choose environmental science at, at MTU, or as it was back then? Um, well, I suppose um, I just want to start off by saying I had no clue what to do in college. Um, I was very struck between choosing science or engineering. Um, and just for a handy tip for all of you, if you're ever stuck like me, I was looking at what was on the modules. So you can look online and see what you're going to do in first year all the way through to the final year. So I was like, oh yeah, that would suit me down to the ground. I'm not great at chemistry, but look, we do a bit of chemistry in first year. Didn't, wasn't mad about analytical um, science. So it kind of hit the nail on the head for me. Um, yeah, it was that mix of science and engineering and a bit of instrumentation, so I was happy out and I always felt like if I could get a job in environmental science, I'd never be stuck for a job because the environment is so important in any, every aspect that you work in. Like every action you do, every process in manufacturing, it has an effect on the environment. So I was like sorted for a job. Very good. And maybe again, um, Ellen, if you want to tell us about whether it's your placement or work, and I know you were, you were quite good at getting, looking for work experience as well in your final year project. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so like Andrew, um, my placement was cancelled as well. Um, and I was gutted because I was like, great, now it'll sort me for a job afterwards. Um, but it was great, as you said, like we got to do the Lean Sigma course. So it's basically teaching about the importance of manufacturing. Um, which actually sprung my interest in in what I was going to do after college. Um, and I suppose it just opens your mind. Like we were put into groups to do the whole Lean Sigma project. We were split up. So I was with someone from instrumentation. I was with an analytical, analytical chemist. Um, and learning to work with those people is such, like, it's such an advantage when you go on then to your working world because you'll never be working with someone who's exactly like you or did exactly your course. Um, so it's great to get that practice in because everyone thinks differently and how you, whatever you did in college will build you up to be different. Um, so I thought that was great. Like, and then moving on to my final year project, I did it on um, air quality and how our air quality changed during COVID. So as you can imagine, when we were all locked down, no one was allowed to go two kilometres from their home, I think, at the start, and then five kilometres. Um, and that all plays an effect. So 
that was going back to your environmental, then everything we do has an impact on the environment. Um, so that was really interesting, and I suppose that's why I love the course. It was because you were looking at real life problems and what we do really affects the world, and it was great. Like I sound like a tree hugger, but I'm actually not. <laughs> but yeah, it was great. Very good. And your current role, Ellen? Um, yeah, so I went on, um, you'll see it there below my photo, Morto. Um, I'm working with PM Group, so they're project management. Um, so I'm a graduate project engineer, so I'm on a two-year um, graduate program, and I'm basically helping manage a project. So um, my team are currently building a vaccine facility in France and Singapore. Um, so we're literally building it, we're pouring concrete at the moment, so I'm just helping the teams kind of measure that, like, you know, if you think about it, like, even this building here, like, the pipes running through it, there's so many different teams. You have the civils, you have the architects, you have the process lads, and they're all fighting, and I'm like, yeah, lads, calm down. No, I'm all over, but, yeah, it's gas. But um, even like that, like, you know, working in college with different people in different um, courses, like, that's exactly what I'm doing now, you know. I'm doing stuff with the analytical chemists, or I'm doing stuff with the instrumentation lads. Um, so it's really, like... You're like in college, but you're just grown up and you have a big job. And you're getting paid for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> very good. Um, thank you very much, Ellen. So, as I say, if anybody has any other questions, you, you can catch us down there uh, uh, at the end of the session. So, I, I'm nearly done here. I just wanted to put up our, if you do join us, um, this is our first year coordination team. They look pretty normal for scientists. And so, you're, you're, they're, they're all very welcoming. So, um, you'll be well looked after if you do come and join us in, in physical sciences department. And if you want to find out a little bit more about us, what I'd suggest is go on to our website, physical sciences, well, it was.cit.ie, it's now uh, .mtu.ie. Um, you can actually do a virtual tour of some of our labs. You can go in and look at our instrumentation labs. You can actually go into our water quality lab and look at our, our fish tank, which we have running live there. And it's, I can guarantee you it's the, the cleanest fish tank around because we monitor everything in that fish tank. Um, so thank you very much. Please send me an email if you have any further questions and hopefully we'll meet you afterwards as, as well. So I am now going to invite Dr. Bridget Lucy up with her team. Um, Bridget is with the Department of Biological Sciences. Um, we were going to do a, a joint effort for a very short minute because uh, what, what, what we do have in common is that we are both uh, have joint programs with UCC, so I'm sure Bridget will tell you about that. We have the Industrial Physics Program, which is uh, a joint program with, with UCC, Department of Physics, and um, Bridget has a joint program in Biomedical Science with, with UCC as well. So we're, um, our, our job is done for this evening, as I say. Hopefully we'll see you later, and in the meantime, there's going to be a short video um, in relation to MTU that's going to run while, while we change over for a few minutes. So thank you very much. MTU prides itself on being a student-centred university. The close and tight-knit community that we have today really makes it personal to every single student. MTU really does push the boundaries on being as student-centred as possible. Within the Students' Union, we are here to provide a voice for students. We run a number of campaigns throughout the year. Within MTU, there's a number of sports and societies. So we have a number of sports clubs from soccer, football, hurling, etc. And societies is another kind of thing where students can meet like-minded people, people with the same interests, and have a kind of a social aspect as well. MTU, I believe, has students at its heart. One of the mantras we have in student affairs is the voice of the student must always be heard. And for us, that's very, very important that we listen to the student, we listen to what they're looking for, we listen to their changing needs, and we develop our services and grow our services around those various needs. We prepare students to be work ready and also to be life ready as civic minded graduates. Throughout their journey with us, we, we support them in many different ways. We support them in their health and well-being so that they can fully engage with their programmes as well as supporting them academically. And we're very much student-centred in that we want our students to reach their full potential and to flourish.
Good evening, everybody. If you see me point, uh, just appearing at the front of the screen, you'll realise that my eyesight is not that brilliant. So if you, uh, if you see me stumbling a bit, it's probably because I'm, I'm reading poorly. My name is Bridget Lucy. I'm Head of Department of Biological Sciences. And um, I'm delighted that you're here. Thanks for coming along this evening. And um, we hope to tell you all about our programmes in the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm just going to introduce you to the panel before we start off. And uh, to my left is Dr. Leslie Cotter, uh, a lecturer in this department and uh, currently the director of the Joint Programme in Biomedical Science as well. Um, next to her is Jane Kelligan, who is a final year agri-biosciences student here. Um, beside Jane then is Daniel Keeney, who's currently in his fourth year of PhD, uh, having done the BSc Honours in Pharmaceutical Biotechnology, uh, first to qualify him to go on to do a PhD. And um, finally, we have Maeve O'Brien, and she will be talking to you all about um, the Nutrition and Health Science program uh, from the vantage point of having gone through that program and beyond. So um, I'm delighted uh, that they're here to tell you uh, all about those programs. Okay, so um, why study biological sciences in MTU? Well, I can't see the screen, so you're going to be reading it with me. Um, we have undergraduate programs from uh, levels six, seven, and eight, and they're not mutually exclusive. They tend to, to run one to the other. In practice, actually, probably about 98% or even 99% of our students go on to do a level eight rather than stopping at level six or level seven. So if you go in to do a level six, it's not the end. It's possible to go on and do a level seven and do a level eight. Not only that, but you have choices along the way as well. So um, one, of, one of our, I suppose, our, our proudest uh, boasts really is that we are very strong in laboratory skills and that's an integral part of all of our programs, particularly in the first three years of our programs. The fourth year, um, we put our, our laboratory skills to use in a research project, a final year research project. So we, we put a great emphasis on learning through doing, uh, so much so that really you might spend two hours out of every four that you, are, you have contact with a lecturer in the laboratory, and that's how we get to know you very well also. Um, and also, it, it helps you to learn, and it also allows us to get to know you well. And if there are any difficulties along the way, we spot them very quickly then, okay? So we get to know our students very well. Um, also, our um, placement, we put, we put great emphasis on placement, and you'll see in the brochure for biological sciences, that there is a specific section on placement because we, we put a great emphasis on this. It's a huge opportunity for students. You're, but rather than listening to me talking about it, you'll hear the others talking about it in a minute. Um, also, then, uh, we have a ladder structure for entry to degree programs. Um, and we also have very strong employment um, opportunities out of our programs. Um, in many cases, it's, it's the case that employers are waiting for our students to be qualified in order to give them jobs. They say, how soon can you start? Okay, okay so um, the first program of the six undergraduate programs that we have in our department is the BSc in Applied Biosciences. And this is a... a, a BSc, a three-year BSc, a level seven program. It's of three years duration. And I know rather than reading verbatim from the slides, I'll let you read yourselves. Okay. You see that the points took a little jump um, in 2021 uh, from what they were in 2020. Of course, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, the, the pandemic has affected our points um, to some extent. Okay, and this is the career progression then, um, or the course progression. Applied biosciences, you do your, your level six in the first two years, and then you have a choice in third year as to whether to go towards food science or towards biosciences and biotechnology. Okay, so by that stage, you'll have been well guided and also you'll know yourself which area you're most interested in, so your choices are there. Okay. And you can see that you progress then to the level eight programs, whether it's in the nutrition side or the pharmaceutical side. Okay, so you have, you have plenty of choices along the way. Okay, so basically, rather again than, than reading through the slides, you can both see 
the slide here, and also you can see in the brochure in front of you. I'm, as you can tell, in a hurry to talk to our, our graduates. Okay. So one, one point that I want to make is that the common entry in biology, and it's something that you probably would be wondering, what is a common entry program in biological sciences? This is a very useful program uh, to apply for if you're not absolutely certain which, which area you want to go into for your degree, because it allows a possibility for, for in three different directions. One of them is the aforementioned um, BSc Honours in Pharmaceutical Biotechnology. A second one is the BSc Honours in Nutrition and Health Science. And the third one is a program that I haven't mentioned up to now, and it's the BSc Honours in in agri-biosciences, okay? So you have a choice of, of three if you go in as a common entry biology year one, okay? Okay, now we've, we've moved on um, a little bit towards where uh, I, I want to introduce you to our first graduate. And this is Daniel Keeney, and I will ask Daniel to, to give a little bit of a, an introduction about himself, why he might, why he is interested in the area that he chose, and what you're doing at the moment. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess I suppose when it came to the CEO and things like that, I knew I had a strong kind of passion for biology and things like that. I almost didn't even go to college, believe it or not. I kind of didn't know what I want to do, it was almost like choice paralysis, you know? So uh, yeah, I remember just the career guidance counselor telling me, you know, try pharma biotech. It has a lot of great job opportunities coming out of it and it's very biology focused. So I kind of figured, well, that would probably suit me down to the ground, you know? Because I suppose pharma biotech is all about creating biopharmaceutical drugs like uh, insulin using living cells and then all the different kind of um, I suppose steps that come with that then, such as uh, purification, documentation, you know, everything that it takes to get the drug out to the consumer in a safe and effective way, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really kind of uh, interesting to pursue and follow along. And yeah, I studied that from 2014 to 2018. And then, uh, yeah, after that, I was uh, in interested in research. So I was able to jump from pharma biotech straight into doing a PhD. So yeah, it kind of took me everywhere. Pharma bi biotech doesn't kind of pigeonhole you into one sort of direction. It kind of definitely primes you for industry, but it allows you to, I suppose, move into lots of different career paths and things like that, yeah. And I suppose as we're on the subject of your PhD, you might as well tell them what you're doing for your <laughs> PhD as well. Yeah, so I'm a trying to genetically engineer bacteria for bioremediation on Mars, essentially yeah, to detox the soil on Mars. So. Yeah, again, that's a far cry from uh, pharma biotech, you know, mm. so anything is possible with it, essentially, you know, once you kind of have the foundational work of, I suppose, biology behind you, you can take it anywhere, you know, and that's kind of the universalness of it, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's very good. Um, so I suppose I, I might as well ask you some of the questions that, that we've uh, already been, been asked um, to answer. Um, and I suppose one of them would be, you know, how much time will be spent in the labs while I'm studying? Um, yeah, it's pretty 50-50, which I find is a really kind of good change of pace, I guess, from constantly looking at like lecture notes and things like that. Um, I suppose C or MTU now, I was going to say CIT, uh, boasts like, the fact that students are in the labs constantly, they get a lot of hands-on work. Uh, I, I presume, like, when I was in college even, and I kind of compared myself to my counterparts in different colleges doing similar enough courses, I always kind of felt that uh, being, like, in MTU and all the kind of experience that we have in the lab, it always made us a bit more competent, I think, and comfortable, and we were able to kind of hold our own a bit better, I think, compared to people in similar positions just in different colleges. Mm -hmm. and I think that definitely kind of showed when it came to placement then as well. Everyone that I kind of spoke to slotted right into industry, no bother. Yeah, it's really good. I suppose it's, it's very useful from a postgraduate point of view as well. If you're going to be doing a PhD in the lab, yeah, uh, it's absolutely. good to have built up your, your skills as yeah, well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I suppose one of, the, one of the things that Daniel um, is doing at the moment as well, you might be interested to know this, is that he's, he's undertaking some mentoring of final year undergraduate research students for their research projects. 
Um, and I suppose it's one of those things that we're very interested in doing that, uh, you know, if you have a PhD student who, uh, who has been very recently an undergraduate student, that they understand how an undergraduate student is going to feel when they're starting to do their research project. They might feel frightened, and I, I think it's probably something that you might like to comment on as well. Yeah, exactly. I think, like I said, there's definitely a bit of a choice paralysis when it comes to CAO and picking the subjects that you want to do or even just trying to find a career path. I'd kind of just say, I think, follow where your passion is, essentially, where your interests lie. You know, don't go with something that sounds cool just because it might sound a bit more pre prestigious over something than other, you know, especially when it comes to colleges as well. Don't kind of get blindsided by the big names and things like that, I'd say. Mm. Uh, really look at where you know your interests lie, where your passions lie, and then a college that kind of matches those values, I think, for sure. Yeah, Yeah, and that's good. Um, somebody asked, do I need chemistry at Leaving Cert uh, level? Uh, no, I wouldn't think so, to be honest. Um, the way, I suppose, farm biotech runs anyways is that everybody comes in and they're taught as if they've never encountered any of these subjects before. So the fundamental subjects like maths, physics, chemistry, biology, they're all taught as if you've never done them before, so everybody's on the same level. Mm -hmm. I presume having, if you did study any of those subjects before, it does, it's a help, you know, I guess, because it's not the first time that you've seen those, uh, those, the content that you'd be coming across, but essentially, no, like I didn't do physics or anything like that, I wasn't confident in maths, and I got through it fine, like, as long as you put in the work, and I suppose here I am doing a PhD, you know, so anyone can kind of do it. <laughs> I don't know. With a bit of work. That is. <laughs> but yes, he, Daniel is right. I suppose it, it does emphasize the fact that we, we don't expect that everybody who enters the science program in our department is going to have chemistry or physics or honours maths, uh, for example. I mean, it would be very, very unusual, I suppose, not to have biology, but technically you, don't ha you wouldn't have to have biology. Um, you'd have to have some science subjects, but... Uh, and, and you may have to work a little harder in first year, but the purpose of first year for, to a large extent is to try to make, uh, make it easy for a student to settle in properly, to come to the same level as everybody, that everybody comes to the same level at every subject at the end of first year. So everybody is then ready to go forward so that we can, move, we can look forward and we can start to specialise a little more. And it builds expertise and confidence and we need people to feel confident in order to be, I suppose, to make it easy for them to learn and also to be creative um, it, when it comes to doing, um, you know, scientific writing or um, research in the laboratory or anything like that. So, um, what else now? Is there work placement on the course, somebody asked? Yeah, absolutely. Um, most of them seem to be paid as well. You know, it kind of depends on the company, but a lot of them, I'd say about 70% of them are paid, which is always great as well. I did my placement in MSD Brinney down in the Shannon, and I thought it was a great help. I know lots of my friends, uh, once they had kind of finished placement, they were kept on. Uh, they were actually given jobs there, you know, even without the degree going into fourth year, they used to work on the weekends and, uh, yeah, they used to balance college, balance college even then with the weekdays and mm -hmm. a lot of other of my friends were given places in grad programs which are really competitive and are open nationwide, you know, so it really does give you kind of a foot in the door and, uh, yeah, it makes you just super employable, for yeah, that's sure. That's really good, yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, the next program um, that we want to look at is the BSc Honours, the Level 8 program in Nutrition and Health Science. Um, so um, I just want to introduce you to Maeve O'Brien um, at this point as well. And would you like to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so how I actually started out was I did the common entry that was already spoken about. So the reason I did this was because I was very unsure between the nutrition and the pharmaceutical one. Um, so I was like, I'm not going to jump into anything. I will see first which one I like and I'll make a decision then. Um, so the first two years, it was great. I got a very good overview. So it is something I would recommend if you're 50-50. Um, we had the same opportunities in third year you branch out. Um, I think it was very split between both courses and you're guaranteed to get your place in either course. Um, it was a fantastic course. I have absolutely no regrets with it. Um, you learn a lot on the actual course. There is lab work. I know that's another question coming. Um, mm -hmm. But in first year, you actually have a, a module for lab operations. So it gives you a good overview into the basics for labs. So if it is something you're nervous about, don't be. The support is there for you. 
and the groundwork is done for you in first year. Um, and I know for Levi, so that's another question. Uh -huh. um, but for some of the exams you might be doing for, or for chemistry and physics, don't be crossing out um, if that's your kind of borderline for the course. As they all say, there's so much help here for, for the chemistry. Um, I know I struggled with chemistry and I did it in Leaving Cert. It was my strong suit and I thought I needed it for the course. I went to lectures for help. I went to, um, we have extra support classes here. And it's just fantastic support here for you. So if you are struggling, I wouldn't like say give up or anything like that. Just keep going, the support's there for you and the lecturers want you to do well. So just them to note if you are considering the course, just to bear that in mind for it. That's very good. Do you want to tell the audience what you're doing now as well? A little um, bit? Yeah, so when I finished um, college, I finished during um, COVID. So I went into Bandon Vale. So it's a factory in Bandon and there I did quality. I actually didn't really like the role that I was in. Um, I knew fairly quickly it wasn't for me. So I always wanted to get into Atlantic Clinical Trials, which is in Blackpool. Um, and I got in there in October and I absolutely loved it. This is a route that I think not many people actually know about. Um, and bear in mind, there was six just from my year alone inside in that company. And 50% of the workers inside there came from this course. So it does, it's a great representative of this course in CIT. Um, so I was there for a year, got great experience, absolutely loved it. And then I got Eli Lilly, and I'm now a trial capabilities associate in there. And I wouldn't have got there if I didn't do Atlantia. Um, so I think it is very good to find what route you want to go in. The great thing about this course is that it's so broad. When I was told it was so broad, I nearly found it overwhelming because I was like, what route do I want to go down? There can be lab, there's quality, there's clinical trials, there's PhDs, there's masters, there's so much there. That's why work placement is a great opportunity because you get to try out where you like and where you don't. Um, I actually went to the Mercy University Hospital because I thought dietetics was what route I wanted to go down. Um, loved the experience, had a great placement, but I just knew it wasn't for me. Um, so if, it, if you are considering dietetics, it is a good route to try. Um, so from there, yeah, I just knew clinical trials is where I wanted to be. I love the hands-on interactions. I love working with people. Um, so yeah, there is very different routes. I know a lot of my friends are working in labs, a lot are in quality. So there really is great opportunity with this course if you are considering it. That's great. Thanks very much, May. Actually, slightly left of, of field, somebody wanted to know what personal uh, skills are most suited to the course? Somebody wanted to know. So I think good communication skills, um, something that I found I was dreading going into college was presentation skills. Um, this is something I kind of wanted to get out of my comfort zone, so this course is good for that. There is presentations. Don't think of it as a daunting experience. You work in teams for it, um, and you do develop that as you go through the four years. This is something now I actually wouldn't be scared of um, at the end of the four years. You have good teamwork skills. Like I said, there is some teamwork projects on it, uh, which is actually very good. Good interaction way of uh, meeting your class. Um, and good hard working skills. There is... Um, a lot of hard work involved in it, but it's very rewarding at the end of the day. Um, like it's already mentioned, I think CIT courses are really recognised in the workplace. So I think what you put in is what you get out at the end of the day. Um, good analytical skills and IT. Um, I'm not very good at computers either myself, but there is courses or there's modules for IT um, which did strong or make me more strong at the end of the day with these skills. Um, so if you go in with an open mind, you'll come out with the result that you want, I think. That's very good. Um, somebody also wanted to know how much my time will be spent in labs while I'm in college. <laughs> um, yeah, so lab is a big fraction of it. So in first year, um, I think out of six modules, there was four modules had labs. This could be two hour blocks, it could be one hour block, it depends on the module. Um, the things about labs is they're a great way to earn credit. So um, you can get a lot of points there by the time your exams come, you could have the module pass by the time you go in. So I would put the work into your labs because it'll take the pressure off when it comes to Christmas exams or end of year exams. You do have less time in second year, I think, for labs. And in third year, because you have placement, it's only the first semester, I think. And in fourth year, we had none. So it is very full on at the start, but if you like it, you're going to love it. Um, and you will grow to love it if you don't like it either, I think. <laughs> it's good to know. 
Okay, so thank you very much. That's great, babe. Um, okay, then the next program that we want to talk about is the uh, BSc Honours in Agri-Biosciences. And Jane Kelligan is going to uh, tell us a little bit about herself first, and uh, then we, we can go through some questions in a minute. Um, yeah, so I'm in my final year of Agri-Biosciences. Um, I just finished placement um, during the summer. I was in Chagas. Um, I'm currently working on my literature review for my final year project and um, I'm just looking forward to finishing it and getting into industry. Um, so yeah. Very good. And why did you choose this course? Um, so I did the common entry. Um, so I got to see all three mm. types of courses and I got to try all the different modules. Um, so I found it great. Um, I knew going in that I wanted to do biology and I was pushed um, towards pharma. But then once I got in, I just liked the modules of the agribioscience. I thought it um, mixed the pharma and the nutritional health together because we do a lot of um, veterinary diagnostics um, as well as work within the agri-food uh, industry. And somebody wants to know a good bit about the work placement on this particular um, program. Yep, well. so I was in Chagas, the Food and Agriculture Authority of Ireland in Moor Park. So I got to work on a PhD project in the pig development department. And I'm not from a farming background, but um, I, the hands-on work with the animals was great. And I also got a lot of time in the lab. Um, so I got to see the food department as well. Um, and it just gave me huge confidence in what I know from the course and the modules that I've completed here. Um, just the techniques I have um, in the lab and also my organisational skills and teamwork also um, through the practicals that we've done here and the modules, like the knowledge that I know um, is very vast in the uh, industry. Yes, thanks very much, Jane. And how does, if somebody wants to know, how does the course differ from a traditional agricultural science um, course? Yes, yeah, so the course is a hybrid between um, traditional agricultural courses and also biological sciences. Uh, so we do um, a lot of the traditional um, modules such as animal reproduction, animal uh, nutrition, and veterinary diagnostics, um, but also the biological side, so we do a lot of biotechnology, um, immunology, and so we cover a wide range of topics, and we also look into the veterinary diagnostic side and um, the agri-food industry. We do a lot of modules um, linking food and to the farm. That's great. And somebody wants to know what kind of jobs could I, could I work in with a, a degree in agribiosciences? Um, yeah, so just after doing placement, I seen how much job is out, how many jobs are out there and in the different departments. Um, there is quality assurance, quality control within the food department, um, as well as research and development. Um, there is veterinary diagnostics is a big one at the moment as well. Um, supplements um, and then the traditional um, microbiology and anything within the lab like we have such um, skill set for the lab that it's so interchangeable between the science sectors um, but the focus on the agri sector is great um, to work from the farm um, up to the food industry and right across the science sectors. Very good. And it's probably not a fair question, but what's next for you? Would you, would you uh, like to um, tell us? <laughs> uh, after being in Chagas, like, it, I had such um, a great experience with mm -hmm. PhD students and master's students and the amount of research that goes into agriculture at the moment, especially with sustainability. Um, so I would be looking to do a PhD um, when I finish, hopefully. <laughs> um, but there is a lot of jobs as well within the industry that I wouldn't mind going into. Um, but definitely into animal nutrition as well. Very good. So you've got a wide variety, really, to choose from. Okay. Um, and 
The next now is the BSc Honours in Biomedical Science. And Dr. Leslie Cotter beside me here, as I said, is the Programme Director of the Joint Programme in Biomedical Science at the moment. Uh, for since both of us are actually state registered medical scientists as well, it's, uh, I think once you become one of those, it's very hard to, <laughs> there's no getting out of it in the end. Um, so I, I, I should really just ask Leslie to, to give a little rundown on Leslie's a bit sorry now that she didn't invite a student to do this because I'm sure, based on what our current student and graduates have said, you probably much prefer to hear from them. Um, but anyway, uh, so our biomedical science program is uh, our joint program with UCC down the road, and um, we take in since this year we're taking in 40 students into the program um, they spend some amount of time in UCC every week and some amount of time in MTU now um, uh, they uh, are suppose are primarily um, in training to work in hospital laboratories as medical scientists um, I suppose medical scientists have become I suppose uh, more widely known as to what they do now since the COVID pandemic. Um, we're all hearing about testing for um, COVID-19 in the labs and medical scientists have, uh, have made the press, I suppose, and maybe people didn't realise what they did up to, up to relatively recently. Kind of the background job in the hospital, a critical role um, in the diagnosis of disease, um, helping, I suppose, clinicians to um, make decisions about treatment and prognosis, etc. So I suppose our, our role in the background has been highlighted by the recent pandemic. So maybe we should be grateful for that. Um, so there's a quite, quite a variety of um, specialisms that you can work in in biomedical science. Um, I suppose beginning with, I suppose, the microbiology, because that's where the COVID pandemic has brought us to, to understanding what the medical scientist does. So you can work in the, I suppose, uh, diagnosis or detection of infection. Um, you can work in hematology, looking at blood and blood disorders. You can work in transfusion science, where you'd be, I suppose, trying to match um, donor blood that you might donate at the blood transfusion clinic to patients who might require it for, um, I suppose, operations or nor normal surgical procedures, or um, you know if they've had an accident or if they've had um, a bleed for some reason. Um, so that's a critical role that the medical scientist plays um, in clinical biochemistry, looking at, um, I suppose, important um, markers in the blood that indicate various disease processes, um, and I. I'm missing one, pathology, um, where you're looking at tissues. Um, so, you know, often, I suppose, maybe the simplest tissue that's presented is a biopsy sample because they'd be taken quite frequently. Uh, and the scientists would be looking at the biopsy samples, um, I suppose, in a lot of cases for, for cancer. Um, so that's, I suppose, the five main areas of biomedical science. Um, I suppose an important thing to mention is that if a graduate wishes to be a medical scientist, they have to complete our four-year uh, joint BSc program and then subsequently do um, a post-grad diploma in clinical laboratory practice, um, which is a one-year program offered by MTU. So it's the combination of the two of those that qualifies graduates to work as a medical scientist. If an individual decides they just want to complete the degree and not progress to clinical placement, that's also an option. Um, and they can then go off and work in other areas. Um, they would have a good foundation in biochemistry, microbiology, um, quality assurance, um, lots of other areas where they could work in other, other um, I suppose, other fields like pharmaceuticals are in quality um, and also there's research potential there as well and now you definitely wish there was a student up here talking. <laughs> <laughs> and I, there was a question here which is um, is this a joint course and how much time is spent in each of the two colleges? Yeah. It's a different core program in the sense that the other programs we've, we've talked about are all entirely um, conducted within MTU itself here, um, except that the placement can take you out into industry. Um, the, the final programme we're looking at here, the biomedical science one, is, is somewhat different in that it's a joint programme with UCC. Yeah, so it, uh, as Bridget said, it is a, it is a joint programme um, and I suppose 50% of the modules would be taught by MTU and 50% of the modules would be taught by UCC. Um, I suppose for ease for the students, um, we tend to try to keep them on one campus or the other for any particular day. So for example, a first year student on a Monday, that's probably their worst day, um, would be in UCC in the morning and then in the afternoon they're here. And then on Tuesday and Wednesday they were in um, UCC 
Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, they're in UCC, and on Friday, they're in MTU. Um, but um, in each year, it's different, but there is time spent in both campuses with the minimum amount of moving between them as, as we can coordinate or as is feasible. Um, to facilitate that, sometimes the MTU lecturers go to UCC to deliver their lectures rather than moving the 40 students back out here. So, um, yeah, that's, it's between both, both colleges. And uh, somebody asked, what number of class hours would a typical uh, first year have, they, they want to know? Yeah, it's a, it's a busy timetable, I suppose, um, with probably, I suppose, half your time spent in the lab again, um, it, with different kind of, I suppose, um, I suppose some classes would be very large. Um, your, M your MTU modules would be quite small class groups where they'd be taught on their own as the biomedical science group. And then they get the university experience as well where they're in with other programs and they're taught in large groups um, in UCC. So that, that I suppose is how they, how they experience, I suppose, two institutions involved in a joint program. Mm -hmm. Funnily enough, when we, we, have, um, we have joint staff student forums every year for, for every year of every programme, but one might think that people going between UCC and, and ourselves would have difficulty on being on two campuses, and actually they don't. It, it never seems to come up as no, a problem. It's actually Pardon something they all, like. You know? yeah. yeah, and funnily enough, when I was visiting our old uh, PhD supervisor in Dublin in UCD, I thought to myself, it's much more difficult to get from one side of UCD than it is to get from UCC to MTU to this campus, actually. Um, so I, I kind of understood. It, it put it in perspective for me anyway, certainly. Yeah, yeah so... Um, I think that's, that's probably the end of our um, actual presentation. But before we finish, um, it, I suppose what I'd like to say is that um, thank you for listening. Firstly, we'd be delighted to have you uh, to enter our programmes. Uh, we look after our students very well and we're passionate about our science. Uh, you can be quite certain of that. Um, as well as that, then we're going to be around for the next uh, half an hour or so if you want to ask us any questions individually. Now, before, just before we finish, I would like to invite Dr. Brendan O'Connell, who's head of the School of Science and Informatics, uh, just to say a word. Thanks very much, Brendan. And thanks to all of our, of our panel here as well. Thanks very much, Bridget, and um, just to thank everyone for coming along uh, this evening and for your attention. Uh, I think a key um, bit of advice, maybe, and it, what Daniel said earlier really resonated with me. Um, you know, follow what your passion is, identify what you're interested in, get as much information as you can, visit the website, uh, identify who the contact person is in MTU, send us an email, um, if you make an informed decision, you follow what you're interested in, I've no doubt you're going to be good at it and there's opportunities for everyone. Um, again, to reiterate what Bridget has said earlier, uh, we really do look after our students in MTU. We're absolutely student-centred. You've, you've heard from uh, the, the students and the graduates, the value of placement, uh, how career-focused we are. I suppose following on from that, I'd like to thank um, the staff and students of the university for taking the time to come along tonight and participate in this event. Also, I'd like to thank the marketing unit uh, in MTU and the support staff. You know, in the COVID-19 pandemic as we're in, it's an evolving situation and we have to adapt and we're hugely grateful within the School of Science and Informatics for the support we receive from the marketing unit. So on that note, uh, a bull of boss for everyone. <laughs> so guys, we're, for those who are attending on site, um, we'll be available on the left hand side for the biological sciences program and on the right hand side for the physical sciences programs if you have any questions or you'd like to chat uh, to any of the members of the panel. So again, safe home and thanks very much.